Genetics loads the gun, but it is lifestyle that pulls the trigger. That was Barbara O'Neill, a health educator letting us know that while genes are important, your lifestyle is equally or of greater importance to your health. Barbara is also a nutritionist with a passion for helping people achieve optimal wellness through natural and holistic approaches. Today, we're tackling an important health issue that affects millions of people worldwide. High blood pressure, also known as hypertension. High blood pressure is often referred to as the silent killer because it can go unnoticed for years while significantly increasing the risk of serious health problems like heart disease, stroke, and kidney failure. Understanding why we get high blood pressure is crucial in taking steps to prevent and manage it effectively. In this video, we'll explore the common causes of high blood pressure at the cellular level. We'll delve into how these factors contribute to hypertension and discuss practical, natural solutions to bring your blood pressure down. We'll cover a range of strategies that you can easily incorporate into your daily life to support healthy blood pressure levels. So, if you're concerned about high blood pressure or looking for natural ways to manage it, you're in the right place. Let's listen to Barbara tell us a bit about the importance of sodium. Lining our gastrointestinal tract of villi. And on the villi is a receptor site. And that receptor site is to take the glucose through and into the blood. So on this villi, we've got a blood capillaries that go all the way through. Now in that receptor site is a carrier. And this carrier is designed to take the glucose through to the blood. But the carrier will not accept the glucose unless it comes with a molecule of sodium. So, sodium is very important. Sodium is the main transport system of glucose across the brush border wall and into the blood. And yet what are we told? Don't eat salt. <laughs> well, I agree with the table salt because it causes this imbalance of minerals in and out of the cell, absolutely. What is it in table salt that makes it so bad? And did you know that sodium chloride is so strong it can kill the taste buds? Have you seen people that eat table salt? They put it on everything and they put it on before they've even tasted it. Well, no wonder their taste buds are dying. Whereas Celtic salt, with all of its minerals, it, it enhances the flavor of the food. Is sodium useful in other ways? And did you know that sodium chloride is so strong it can kill the taste buds? Have you seen people that eat table salt? They put it on everything and they put it on before they've even tasted it. Well, no wonder their taste buds are dying. Whereas Celtic salt, with all of its minerals, it, it enhances the flavor of the food. So, Sodium really is very important. So as you can see, water is very important. But so is the salt. And again, the potassium is found in all your fresh fruits and vegetables. Now Barbara will tell us a little about calcium. Calcium cannot get into the cell by itself. It needs vitamin D. When vitamin D is present, the calcium is pulled inside the cell. And remember, I showed you the other day that calcium is called the king because when it gets into the cell, all the other minerals piggyback on the back of calcium. Barbara will now tell us about how magnesium can help. Something else happens. I'd like to go back to this for a moment. When the magnesium is put on the tongue and you have the glass of water or half a glass, a little bit later the other half glass, that magnesium pulls the water inside the cell. And in the bilayed membrane that is around every cell, there's a little motor. And when the water's pulled through the membrane and into the cell, it causes that little motor to start spinning. And the spinning of that motor gives us a unit of energy. So when you're feeling a little tired or maybe a little bit peckish mid-morning, have the salt and have the water and you'll get a little bit of a pickup. Now Barbara will tell us about energy cycles within our cells. We've looked at the inside of the workings of the cell a few times 
and the way I explain it, it looks like there's one energy cycle per cell, but it is not true. So what I've drawn, you, drawn for you here is a whole lot of little energy cycles. In fact, in the muscle cell, you can have a hundred energy cycles to a muscle cell. I can hardly get my mind around that. And that's why the saying that you, you will receive more energy than you expend on your morning walk. Because each one of those little energy cycles will give 18 times more energy if enough oxygen is going into your body. Now we will learn about glucose and how it gets into the cell. Glucose, it can't get into the cell by itself. It has to have insulin. Insulin's the key that unlocks the door to let the glucose into the cell. And what happens with many people, before diabetes develops, insulin resistance develops. You've heard of insulin resistant? And when insulin resistance develops, the cells resisting insulin, so the glucose can't get into the cell, so the glucose stays in the blood, and the brain says to the pancreas, more insulin, more insulin, but the problem's not more insulin, the problem is there's insulin resistance at the cellular level. Barbara will now reveal what causes insulin resistance and how we can solve it. So what causes the insulin resistance? It's the high carbohydrate, high sugar diet. It's just, get the cell gets to the point where it says, we've got enough, I'm sick of the side of you. So how to recover from insulin resistance is to get the glucose, those carbohydrates right down, get the fiber up, the good proteins and the healthy fats. That's the best way to recover from insulin resistance. Diet plays a crucial role in managing and potentially reversing insulin resistance. Foods rich in fiber, healthy fats, and nutrients can improve insulin sensitivity and help regulate blood sugar levels. Leafy greens such as spinach, kale, and Swiss chard are excellent choices due to their high fiber content and low glycemic index, which help stabilize blood sugar levels. Berries, such as blueberries, strawberries, and raspberries are also beneficial because they are low in sugar and packed with antioxidants that reduce inflammation. A key factor in insulin resistance. Healthy fats found in avocados, nuts, and seeds can improve insulin sensitivity. These foods are rich in monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats, which have been shown to have a positive effect on blood sugar control. Fatty fish like salmon, mackerel, and sardines are excellent sources of omega-3 fatty acids which help reduce inflammation and improve insulin sensitivity. Whole grains, such as oats, quinoa, and brown rice, provide complex carbohydrates and fiber that help maintain stable blood sugar levels. Legumes, including beans, lentils, and chickpeas, are also high in fiber, and protein, which can help reduce insulin resistance by slowing the absorption of sugar into the bloodstream. Finally, incorporating foods rich in antioxidants and anti-inflammatory properties such as green tea, cinnamon, and turmeric can support overall metabolic health and improve insulin sensitivity. By focusing on a diet rich in these nutrient-dense foods, individuals can better manage insulin resistance and reduce the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. But you just imagine for a moment, and this is happening in America a lot today, people are not drinking enough water, they're not having the whole salt and they're definitely not having many greens, which is where your magnesium is. So the little bit of water they're having is not getting inside the cell. They don't go out in the sunshine because they're scared of getting skin cancer. So they're not getting their vitamin D. So the calcium can't get in and the minerals can't get in. And they're trying to lose weight, so they've listened to a lot of the media hype that you've got to stop the fat because fat will make you fat. 
So they're on a high carbohydrate diet. Remember what fat will do? It'll give you satisfaction or a satiation of full feeling. But if you're not having any fat, you just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. The whole packet of cookies goes, the whole chips go. There's almost, there's not a sign in your body that says enough. It's the fiber, protein, and the good fats that will give you that sign. No wonder we're confused. So they're on a high carbohydrate diet, thinking that if they go fat free, they'll lose weight. And can you see what's happening? The water can't get in, the minerals can't get in, the glucose can't get in, and the body says, what are we gonna do? Because remember, this is the CBD of the human body. What are we gonna do? And the body says, we've got one last thing up our sleeve. We'll just force it into the cell. That's high blood pressure. Where do we get high blood pressure from? So high blood pressure can be a result of dehydration. It can be a result of mineral deficiency, magnesium deficiency. It can be a result of vitamin D deficiency. It can be a result of a high carbohydrate, high sugar diet. It can be a result of inactivity. So there's a whole lot of things that can come together to contribute to high blood pressure. That's why the detective hat has to be put on to find out why these things are so. And in some cases, it'll be a bit of this one. In some cases, a bit of that one. In some cases, other things. And you saw from the first lecture, it seems a long time ago, doesn't it? Back to Monday. <laughs> We looked at how genetics loads the gun, but it is lifestyle that pulls the trigger. So the cell and understanding the workings of the cell is paramount to understanding how these things affect the body. Remember, your health is the lock and we're here to provide the keys. Keep turning to Key Health for insights that unlock your full potential. The key to lifelong vitality is in your hands. It's just one bite away.